Hi, everybody. I, um, my name's Hillary Pennington, and I'm going to be the moderator of this, uh, of this session. So welcome back in. Grab your, grab your seats. We're, we're making some um, adjustments as the day goes along. I hope you'll think of them as improvements, not just adjustments. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna give to give a longer lunch break, about an hour of a lunch break. So that means we'll, we'll, um, we'll do this session for about an hour. And before we start, um, having heard such fantastic uh, overviews from Ron Brown and, and um, these presidents panel in the morning, uh, let's just start learning a little bit more about who's in the room. So how many of you here uh, work in higher education institutions? Just raise your hands. OK. How many of you work in the US Department of Education? Raise your hands. And how many of you are here from the Hill? Zero. I think they have hearings. Uh, today. So that's, an, that's, that's lost. How many from the media? OK. And then other, any other? And, and how many other? <laughs> Trade associations? Oh, my goodness. And that, would that be mostly associations? Yes. Well, welcome. And uh, we are going to get to the Q&A, I think, a little bit more quickly in this session. That they, we got great questions, I think, from all of you the last time around. Um, but we're going to start out. Uh, so this is a panel that is going to dive a little bit deeper into the strategies these institutions are using, particularly around student progress and student success. You heard a lot about the kinds of things that they're doing. Um, to me, one of the most striking things about uh, participating in this research and listening to the first panel this morning is the importance of the vision of the leaders of the institution. There's a coherent vision for what these institutions are about that is driving every choice the institutions are making. So this panel, hopefully, is going to give us a little bit of a chance to go deeper into those, a chance to go deeper into some of the trade-offs you all have made as you've made the choices that you've done. I know you're going to talk a little bit about uh, failures and what, what's worked well and what hasn't, and uh, what you think some of the lessons are uh, for others. But we're going to start by just um, letting each of them um, start off with about a three-minute quick overview. And I, they know already, will cut them off at around <laughs> <laughs> the three-minute mark, so we can get more quickly to um, interactive part of the of the conversation. But let's start with you, Mark. You've got to do this in three minutes. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Uh, I'm going to follow up on something I said in the earlier session: is there is not one solution to the issue. So you got to start with the commitment that the the goal is if you admit a student, you expect that student to graduate. And then literally, what we've been we've done is we've chipped away at the barriers. What are the things that students trip over, stumble over, or get blocked by? Um, so it is more proactive um, financial advising, working more closely with students, trying to identify who's going to have financial issues before they hit so that they don't become a problem. Uh, it's getting them into freshman learning communities early, getting them engaged so that they become part of the institution, even if they're first generation, so that they have a social support network. Having the peer um, mentoring system in place if they do get into academic trouble is important. Uh, but one of the things I didn't mention this morning, uh, which is an another important example of what we're trying to do to improve success, is we didn't talk this morning about actually figuring out what you want to be when you grow up. Students come in and they have majors. And one of the things we found is we could have a student who has amassed 120 semester credit hours, which at most institutions in the country will get you a baccalaureate degree. And yet with 120 credit hours, they're nowhere near a baccalaureate degree because they've been circulating through different parts of the pond, if you will, and they haven't settled in one place. So uh, working with the Educational Advisory Board, we've put in place an electronic advising system where we can now tell no later than the end of your third semester, in many cases after one or two semesters, whether or not you're likely to be successful in the major you've chosen. And it turns out that in most cases, it comes down to a single course. And that is that if you don't get at least a B or better in that course, you're probably not going to make it in your major. In nursing, for example, it's your first lab science. You get a C in your first lab science, you're not even going to get into the nursing program, let alone get out of it. Um, if it's physics, my guess would be Calc 1. You know, if you can't do calculus, you can't do physics. And then there's a lot of things in between. So there's a course for finance. There's a course for all these things. So it's, again, looking holistically at the entire ecosystem for supporting the students, trying to remove barriers and obstacles so that they can get on track and continue on track to graduation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's less than three minutes. Great. He set a high bar. <laughs> he did. Well, let, let me just dive a little deeper, as you sure. said, into one of the strategies I think that we all mentioned was uh, the learning communities. We have now more than two thirds of our students involved in learning, our entering freshmen involved in learning communities, but they haven't all worked. 
So the ones we did in one college, for example, our College of Natural and Agricultural Science is much more successful than the ones we did in our College for Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. So we've had, in this data-driven approach yep. that you've mentioned, we've had to go in and look about that. And it's not, it, you know, it increased, even in, at its most successful, it increased our freshman retention to sophomore year by about 8%. So it's not, you know, yeah. not one thing that made the big difference. And different um, students, uh, there was differential positive effects. So for example, our lowest income, our women and our Hispanic, our Latino students benefited more than other students in there. So, you know, it gives us a way to target perhaps or, you know, to know, to know what to do. We've all mentioned um, supplemental education. Well, you know, part of supplemental education, uh, the student has to, they can be identified. We say, we have an early warning system, you're in trouble. Faculty can say, you need to go. But we also need you know, s strategies to get them to do it. E we found that students who took advantage of supplemental education improved by a half to a whole grade. But we had a whole bunch that didn't bother. So we're, s we're in the process of figuring out motivational strategies that would say, look, you can do it. And we think that this peer approach, and, and something that might be counterintuitive, because we've been talking now about maybe you know, reducing risk, is that we have expanded by 100% our um, honors program. So where we used to have just uh, 50 or 60 kids in the first two years, now we ha are, have moved to 100 students a year. We've been moving up to 200 students a year for all four years. And so what that does is create, these are all able kids, but it creates a magnet for kids to be motivated to do exceptionally well. Uh, and that has turned out to be a, a great strategy, and we hope we'll be up to 800 kids a year, um, or 800 kids over the four years, because uh, the retention rate for honors kids is enormously high, 90, 100. It doesn't matter whether you came from a low economic family or a Latino family or whatever. It did, that, that has proven to be a really um, kind of two by four uh, intervention. And I guess the last thing I would mention is that, you know, we've spent some money on it, creating incentives for faculty, small uh, grants for faculty to include uh, undergraduates in their research um, uh, teams. Not, you know, some students are volunteers and some get uh, a little bit of, of payment. But that's another area where if we can get an undergraduate involved with a faculty researcher, that the, uh, the chances are 90%, 95% that they're going to finish and actually uh, choose to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. We, uh, three minutes. Perfect. we would have three uh, strategic thrusts uh, that we focus on mainly. Uh, the first being advisement. Uh, second is uh, learner support. And uh, the third would be engagement. Now, the advisement we've talked about, we've gone to the professional advisor. It's a much more efficient system than asking faculty members to take their energies away from instruction and research to do uh, student advisement. There's still going to be a fair amount of faculty involvement in advisement, but you don't ask them to go through the course schedule and do that, that sort of work with students. Um, we also focused early on on the first year. Uh, we, we looked uh, uh, with some amazement when I first uh, got to the institution back in 92 uh, at uh, uh, freshman to sophomore uh, persistence rates that were uh, below 70 percent, about 68 or 69 percent. That's inexcusable for the quality of students that we had. Uh, so we've been able to raise it to about 88 or 89 percent and we're still, you know, we're going to get it above 90 percent uh, fairly soon, we believe. Um, and, and we've also focused on uh, trying to get our, our uh, uh, four and six year completion rates up. We're at about 65 percent now and there's no reason why we can't get above 70 percent in a, a reasonable amount of time with the resources we're now devoting to it. In the learner support area, uh, I liked what Jane said about the uh, honors program. We bring in about 500 honors students uh, each fall. Uh, they are really top quality kids. They are the leaven for the loaf in many, in many areas and their, um, their uh, retention rates are, are really good. We also have uh, in addition to supplemental instruction, uh, we've redesigned some freshman courses uh, that are high attrition 
uh, courses, uh, typical things that are that are being being done. Uh, uh, a um, math mall course uh, that's got students from sort of dreading math to talking about going to the computer supported uh, uh, work that they're uh, doing and logging more hours than are required. In the engagement area, um, you know, the, the, the undergraduate research is an underappreciated uh, tool, I think. We spend about a million dollars a year supporting undergraduate uh, research over and above what uh, faculty members who are principal investigators of their own uh, grants are able to do. That pays, I think, a big dividend in student satisfaction and completion. We, I, we haven't documented the completion, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, really important. We've got the biggest uh, partnership with junior achievement in the world, we're told, and that's a way for students to get out into the schools and help uh, community organizations succeed in educating uh, junior high school uh, and high school kids. So we're, we're doing uh, uh, a number of things um, one, one issue I would say that we addressed early on uh, was how, uh, how can you um, scale? Because uh, we were growing even then. And you know, to, and to some extent, growing from the low 20s to 30 was a big mm -hmm. jump. Um, and what we found was we couldn't really expect a lot in the way of continued increases in funding. So we had to reallocate. And that, if you're, going to, if you're going to operate that way, you really have to understand what's likely to work, and that calls for some good data and some good, uh, some good uh, analysis. I would say now we're moving from uh, descriptive analytics, where you just look at how well this and that it seems to be working, more to predictive analytics, mm -hmm. but that's a work in progress. But even the descriptive analytics really let you focus your, your attentions on things that are likely to matter. On your point of scale and mentioning undergraduate research, is we try to take a, what I'll call a broader look at learning beyond the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the engagement piece. Yes. You know, if, if you've got 20, 30, 40, 50,000 students, not all of them are going to do undergraduate research. But it is realistic that every student should have at least one of the following experiences. Undergraduate research, study abroad, a meaningful internship. Mm -hmm service learning, meaning they're an educational experience that's deeply embedded in the community. If you take it broad enough, and we actually let the, the disciplines do this by major because the opportunities are different for the different majors, but every student should have a signature experience as part of their education. And you know, Getting a college education is not just consuming knowledge that's in books. If it is, we could just go to the library and read the books. Yes. It's the experiences as well, yes. and trying at scale to have a breadth of experiences so that all the students can have, have them in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Great internships are pure gold. Um, I, you know, I, I wish we could have some kind of uh, student uh, uh, service learning. We've got over 20,000 students a year in service learning, but I wish it could be a much bigger number than that. Yeah, I think. More. So can I, I, I have a couple of questions I sure, want to ask sure. you before turning to the audience, and thank you. Um, community colleges and partnerships with community colleges, that is a major part of each of your strategies, and I know for ASU as well. Can you talk a little bit more about how you, uh, how you see yourselves as part of a sort of education ecosystem in your regions, and what that relationship with community colleges looks like, how it's changed over time, what you hope for it for the future? And John, let's start with you, because you've done some of the deepest work there. We've, we've got a great uh, consortium that exists today between uh, four community colleges or state colleges and our university. It's uh, called Direct Connect to UCF and uh, sort of the, the, the baseline uh, description of what it does is uh, if you graduate from either Valencia College, Seminole State College, Daytona uh, College, uh, or um, Brevard Community College, which is now under a new name I'm blocking on right now, uh, and you get an Associate of Arts degree, you are guaranteed admission to the University of Central Florida. Um, in turn, they work with us as they structure their own academic offerings. So that uh, in Florida now, I think all 28 uh, community or state colleges can offer baccalaureate degrees. And in some parts of the state, there's a lot of acrimony between state universities and mm -hmm. state colleges over who will offer what. We don't have that. We have an agreement, a general person's agreement, that we will uh, coordinate with one another. And I, I've insisted to our people uh, a simple thing. Something can't be our job not to do. Uh, so if, if we agree that something needs to be done and we can't or won't offer it, 
we really have no basis for complaint if a state college does. Mm -hmm. Now that, that levels the ground a little bit in, in this area, uh, but it has worked out very well and we've got tens of thousands of students in the pipeline who are coming on to uh, the university. We take more community college transfers than any other uh, state university in Florida uh, and they are successful. It's been a very good partnership for us. Mm -hmm. We do advising on the campuses. We're pushing more and more of that out there. Um, trying to identify uh, the impediments to student success. And roughly how many transfer students a year do you take? From uh, it, it, we bring in about 6,000 in, uh, in the fall and not quite that many again in the spring. And there's a big group in the summer, so right. it's, it's substantial. Significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, you know, also have those connections, although you have a better name. I like UC Direct Connect. Yeah, I'm going to try to... Yeah. Steal that and figure out how to put UCR on the end of it. It's a serious form of flattery. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got something there. But I, and also, I'll, I'll just add a little innovation that we learned about. I, I don't know that we knew we were doing it so differently. We have a very streamlined way to our, make sure that a course taken at a community college, in lieu mm -hmm. of, for example, they haven't gotten their associates, but they took this course. Will that count? Mm -hmm. At some of other universities, uh, this is a major deal. It's mm -hmm. got to go through a big committee. But in fact, uh, UCR, there's a one faculty member can look at that and make a decision, and then it's approved from then on. So it's in the system as an articulated mm -hmm. course. And that has turned out to be, uh, much to our delight, mm -hmm. a big um, yes. um, promoter of understanding about what's offered. And I think the communication between the university faculty and the community college faculty is so critical. Because those the community college faculty, from my experience, they want to do the best for their yeah. students. And they are taking a very undifferentiated group of students. They're working very, very hard. To, uh, to really teach them well, but they have to know what we expect. Yeah. So I think that has been an enormous, yeah. uh, enormous help. They're also doing things that we don't do, but we are now building even more robust pipelines. You know, we'll, we'll be opening our four-year medical school um, this fall, and one thing in the new healthcare world will be, you know, the, the roles of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And mm -hmm. so we've committed to actually, and a lot of those beginning preparations started in community colleges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've committed to close partnerships with them. Looking at that pipeline. Looking at that pipeline and knowing that, for example, by 2020, I believe, or 2021, physician's assistants will need master's degrees to practice. Mm -hmm. So we've committed to be part of, so, you know, solving that kind of pipeline to uh, really populate the healthcare system with the kind of professionals that will need to be successful. Yeah. John, you want to get a word in as well? But yeah, uh, we don't, I won't make claims that Florida does all that many things really well, uh, <laughs> but we've got the common, have a good name. common course numbering system. Yes, yeah. you do. Uh, and the, and the state statewide levels. articulation. And yeah. so that makes it very easy for community college yeah. students to come on to state universities and to know what, what will count and what won't. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big advantage. Vital. Well, that's actually perfect because my neighbors to the south, uh, I don't know whether we copied them or they copied us, but we also have a common set of undergraduate courses that articulate uh, between the institutions. Mm -hmm. So they don't even need to complete an associate's degree mm -hmm. to enroll at Georgia State. But we, we can tell them if a student applies, and this is, you know, Michael made this point earlier, there are admissions criteria at Arizona State, likewise at Georgia State. Uh, we get 13,000 applications. We only admit about half of those. But we then follow up with the students not admitted and saying, you know, you are not ready to start at Georgia State today, but you can go to the following place. Yes. And if you do the following things, we guarantee you a space down the road. And uh, Georgia Perimeter College is a community college that has multiple campuses surrounding the Atlanta metro, is our biggest feeder. Of their students who go to four-year institutions, we get 80% of them. Mm -hmm. And then Atlanta Metro College, which is a smaller community college just due south of us, is another feeder for us. Uh, but the interesting part is it's actually even more of a two-way street. We talked a little bit earlier this morning about online education. Georgia Perimeter, it's got size, it's got scale, it's got multiple campuses, and because of its geographic dispersion, has put a lot of money into online versions of the courses that are in the state general education requirements. So the one thing Georgia State University is not going to do is duplicate that. I, there's no reason for me to, to staff up and create online versions of what the community college already does. And our students can take those courses at Georgia State, count them towards a Georgia mm -hmm. State degree. We, you know, we, we allow for all that. So it's actually a two-way street. If you've got your system working together around the common courses, around common 
um, elements of what's required for a degree at the general level, and the ability to share resources such as the development of online or other materials that require significant investments. It can work very well, and it has for us. So let me ask you two other quick questions before we turn to questions from the audience. Um, the, the, uh, the idea of replication, you know, hear, you hear over and over again that, there, that higher education is a very autonomous sector. Uh, faculty play an enormous role in what institutions decide to do. Leaders like you um, don't necessarily come to their institutions deciding to do the kinds of things that you've put in place um, with the visions that you have. If you were to look at the level of urgency of the country's need, uh, recognizing that we need diverse kinds of institutions, but we are nowhere near on the path we need to be to educate all of our citizens to the degree that we need to. What would be your, what do you think are the, would be the most powerful and most effective ways to get more institutions to do more of what you do? And I guess a sub part of that, I'm struck by how common, how much um, each of you is trying is. How did that come to be? You know, are there ways you talk to each other? Are there things you read? What are the mechanisms? Uh, is it just in the air? Uh, once, you, <laughs> once you become student-centric, uh, talk to us about sort of the idea of how this could be scaled, these strategies could be scaled not just within your institutions, but across higher education as appropriate. There's one limitation that I'll throw out. Um, we can do many of the things we do readily because we are in vibrant metropolitan areas. We've got population basis, there is demand. Uh, and so um, when there's enough demand pushing you, it's easier to get state agencies, trustees, your own faculty, uh, the community, to realize that you need to be uh, in a dynamic growth phase. Uh, we've always said, you know, we've grown from 20,000 to 60,000, but it's not our goal to grow. Our goal is to meet the needs mm -hmm. uh, of, of the region we serve. And if that means growing to 60,000 or 70,000, if we can manage it, we will. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll quit growing when the need is met or we just can't, can't do any more to meet it. Yeah. Uh, so that, having that sustained demand lets the working to scale happen easily. And then I think if you've got pragmatic student-oriented administrations led by top administrations who share that commitment or engender it, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to come to a lot of the same conclusions. Yeah, so it would seem. You yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, the, the message of the land-grant university, and, mm -hmm. and just using that as, as a philosophy mm -hmm. rather than an actual badge, um, when I taught at University of Nebraska, Lincoln, for example, I became absolutely convinced that this was the way a university should be. It should yeah. care deeply about its citizens and the, and the whole development of its citizens, its civic development, its social development, mm -hmm. economic development. So I think, it, you know, I, I would say that's motivated me. And then the literature that really is at the basis for uh, assess learning, re assess outcomes rather than inputs. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, then all this other stuff starts to fall away as being important. You know, what's the rank? What's the, you know, what do they call you? What's the, it's, it's really, are we producing, yeah. are, we, are, are we creating environments that allow students to develop and really leave us with tremendous new skills and critical analysis and uh, obviously new information, but new understandings of the world. So I think to me, those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, certainly reading about what others have done very inspiring, but no, uh, at least for me, we don't get together and talk very often, but maybe these guys do, and I'm <laughs> glad I'm here today. To do that, yeah. uh, Mark? For me, it's actually, uh, I'm gonna say it's a mix of the personal and the political. Um, and this is not a linear path. When I was 18 years old, I didn't sit there and say, I'm gonna do what I'm doing today. Uh, but when I was 18 years old, I was a student in a community college. And then I transferred to a public institution, Towson University, then Towson State on the edge of Baltimore. And then went to Penn State and got my PhD. And it just so happened I got excited about research. And so I spent the first part of my professional career um, in the main as a professor at the University of Michigan, full professor at the University of Michigan. I had grants, I had publications, I got all the good stuff that happens if you're a successful professor at an elite institution like Michigan. Um, and then eventually decide to go on and become a dean, provost, and then president. But along that way, 
uh, you know, I wasn't really focused on these issues, even though this was the world I came from. And then about five, six years ago, uh, the opportunity to lead Georgia State came to me. And in a sense, the light bulb went off of, these are kids. They may, their skin may look different than mine. They may come from different places, but they have the exact same sort of background and opportunities and challenges I had. And decided to pick up the mantle at the institution and basically say, if, there, if I was able to go from community college through public institution to be full professor at the University of Michigan, every one of these students should have the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, that the, and it's only a question of why aren't they succeeding at higher rates than they are, and it, digging into that. The other part, the political part, is then the period from which I've been dean to provost to president has primarily been in recession. Okay, uh, had a conversation with David Ward, um, former chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who's just stepping down from his second term, and I asked him how it went the second time, and he said it's a lot harder than it used to be because you have to cut budgets. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, David, that's all I've ever gotten to do. Yeah. You know, I became a, pro a dean in 2001, and then 9-11 hit, and then they cut our budgets. And we had, you know, I've, had, I've seen many fewer budget increases than budget cuts. And so I've grown up in an environment where I need to justify why the public should invest in my institution. And it's back to what I said earlier this morning is, I don't think I have a very strong case if the public's investing in my institution and my students aren't graduating. If they're giving us money to the fail out students, that is not a wise use of anybody's money. It's not a wise use of the tuition dollar the student pays. It's not a wise use of the taxpayer's dollar. So I've basically considered it an obligation, both for political reasons, but for moral and ethical reasons, that we commit ourselves to the success of our students. I have to say, for me, um, that is one of the most striking and, and surprising things, is to hear how uniformly you each uh, speak to that issue. I think you're unusual among college presidents, um, having heard many college presidents speak about the importance of higher education, the need for continued resources, uh, without really connecting it to what the institutions produce. I'm going to save my last question for the end of the session. I'm going to turn to the audience, because I know we have so many people with uh, depth of knowledge and also probably good and, and harder questions that I could ask you. So uh, let's open it up Are and you start with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what the hard Just keep you yeah. around your seat. <laughs> Yes, please identify yourself. And we and um, I don't know if the microphone is it's still in, the hall. in here. It's traversing the hall. We went so much faster towards our goal. Yeah. They aren't ready. So hang on just for a sec, sorry. I, I was going to add your first generation. Uh, so I would, let me just get to the bottom line. So many of our faculty at UC Riverside are themselves first generation mm. scholars. It's really made a difference. Thank you. We're all, you, all the way up to the front of the room uh, for the first question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, name is Jamal Abdulalim, reporter with uh, Diverse Issues in Higher Education. My question concerns undergraduate uh, research. Uh, this is something that is uh, associated with higher rates of uh, persistence. Well, my and, but it's, 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 un it's an uncommon thing. And my question is, what message do you send the students in terms of getting involved with uh, undergraduate research? Is this something that, uh, who delivers the message and how is it delivered? And I think more importantly, when it comes to students who are uh, first generation, low income, et, et cetera, um, are, are there opportunities to do research that they feel is relevant to the realities from which they come? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that uh, our current look is that about 67% of our students take part in some kind of research mm -hmm. associated with faculty oversight. So some of it's in the lab, like a real genetics lab. Some of it is with faculty in creative writing and theater and art. Some of it is supervised um, kind of work that's outreach and math or um, other community development with our K-12 system. I think right from the beginning in the orientation, we tell our students, approach your faculty member, go to their office hours. This is really important. and that's that is uh, repeated over and over to the students because some of them don't have the natural inclination to go to go do that. So we're we're constantly encouraging them, and we're rewarding our faculty for engaging in these activities. And so we in the, in that kind of meeting in the middle, going from both sides, we find that faculty and students do find each other. So and it and it it's a tremendous. Um, 
advantage for persistence rates and for professional careers and graduate, sc graduate school careers? It's, it's, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. I mean, we, so we talk about it on our website, we celebrate it. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know whether we do this or not, but I'll go back and check, make sure we put it on our Facebook page and our Twitter feed because a lot of our students track with the opportunities through Twitter and Facebook um, as opposed to the website or email. Actually, this generation doesn't believe in email by and large. Uh, but the most powerful thing that can happen is what I referred to earlier, and I'll use you again, is the faculty member tapping the student on the shoulder right. saying, you should try this. You know, that's um, one of the opportunities that we have not yet capitalized on to the, the extent that we should is um, as diverse as our student bodies are, our faculties are not that diverse. And there is no, inst no set of institutions better positioned than the ones here today to fill the pipelines with a diverse set of individuals right. going to graduate school. And we need to become more intentional about tapping students on the shoulder from all backgrounds and encouraging them to be the faculty of the future. We encourage students, uh, whenever I do an orientation session, uh, which I don't, I don't do more than about maybe a fourth of them because of my travel, but I always uh, mention uh, research uh, as a way of boosting uh, postgraduate education opportunities, among other things. Mm -hmm. And we've now gotten to the point where we have our annual student research poster day. Uh, we're, we're looking for bigger spaces. Uh, to put it, it's overflowed the large ballroom in, in our student union. We'll probably have to go to the arena, wow. the basketball arena. And I think to part of your question, having um, participated in the site visits to these institutions, because you are trying to solve your region's problems, mm -hmm. very often the research that yes. the faculty are doing are, are relevant to the communities from which the students come. So there is, I think, that kind of, it, but there is both theoretical research and there is research. Uh, but, and, and there's different ways. There's, mentioned yeah. art is art as a medium come you know when we have our re undergraduate research conference we've got plenty of students displaying their art and it's you know telling their story from their perspective well you've got nursing you've got all sorts of applied yeah. uh, disciplines yeah. social work there, psychology there social, sure uh, public so there health. are lots of opportunities yeah. for students to do work it would be relevant to their backgrounds other questions get one back on the uh, John Nelson with uh, yeah. Wall Street Without Walls um, wondering how the universities might be able to partner with your surrounding communities by use of assets that you have that may not normally be utilized. For example, you have endowments that could that have investments and those investments could be used to, to guarantee in, in investments and loans by the private sector and by other partners. So you could work with community development organizations, the cities, etc. A place like Yale has an endowment of about 25 billion dollars and uh, you know Harvard about 40. You know, how are they use, using their endowment to help with community development and um, connections with the community in a, in a way that would uh, foster a, a true next generation university? Well, um, we, we don't approach the seven, 17 or $45 billion mark, uh, <laughs> but in fact, uh, the, state the state does, but uh, we, have, we have some assets, we have some debt capacity, but um, uh, across the UC and now currently at UC Riverside, we are in fact exploring what we're calling public-private partnerships for, for example, capital improvements as one area where, in fact, it would be good for the environment, good for the our surrounding community. They can make money. We can get things done that we can't get done based on our um, the situation that the state's not going to give us any more money to build buildings. So we are very specifically looking for that. We also, for example, offer some consultation from our school of business to startup companies, um, and have had some pretty dramatic you know, big successes. They in turn have uh, supported scholarships uh, for our students. And our, our new vision for a, a research building is to have the top couple of floors filled with uh, startups or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are looking for the next big thing and have our engineers and material science people on the first three floors and that there would be easy communication uh, among and between the, the two. So I, I, you know, it's a great question, and I think it's definitely the direction that we see that we must go. Well, I would say, we're, you know, I think if again, if you get, you know, all four of us that you've heard from today and others you'll hear from, we'll all talk about incubators, we'll all talk about startups, we'll all talk about bridging the business community. In Atlanta, actually, the um, Atlanta Metro, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce has formed a business higher education council to find it more seamless ways for universities and businesses to work together. So all those good things are happening. Um, however, I'll draw a line on the endowment issue. First off, the endowment belongs to a foundation 
that is a separate entity that is a, is a support of the university. We do not control it. Secondarily, the, the endowment has a fiduciary responsibility, which is to provide a return and to do so responsibly. Uh, they, they, are not a, uh, they do not exist uh, to support anything other than the university. And so I think it's, it's actually a slippery slope to try to direct the endowment to do things that are not in the endowment's direct interest and consistent with their fiduciary responsibilities. If what you're talking about is basically alternative investments, and they can invest in alternative investments. Right, right. They can, they can do alternative investments, and we do alternative investments. But their, their primary responsibility is to support the institution by stewarding the resources available to the institution. Uh, I wish we had the problems that Harvard and Yale do with their, their endowments. <laughs> we would be a rounding error. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. I think the, uh, the, the more hopeful way of helping the community would be through more private par uh, public private partnerships and frankly public public partnerships. We, we've got some uh, instances, uh, as I know uh, uh, Michael does at Arizona State, where we've worked with local governments to uh, create facilities that enable us to uh, help local businesses thrive uh, and do a better job of bringing in people from um, underrepresented communities uh, through separate uh, programs that we, we operate in those facilities. Our, we've got a big uh, dynamic media center that the city of Orlando gave us the facilities for. And, and part of that is meeting the needs of electronic arts for game developers. But there's another component that has brought in uh, K through eight students from a local uh, minority uh, dominated um, enrollment uh, uh, elementary school and middle school. And, and that's doing a, a heck of a job in preparing these kids uh, better for the digital environment that they're in and will be in. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> um, thanks for a great discussion so far. Rob Muller, I uh, teach at the Public Policy Institute at Georgetown and also at the Business School at Maryland, and I have three college-age kids, which makes me totally conflicted um, <laughs> on uh, all these issues. So um, a couple of quick things. One is the discussion about um, kind of high expectations, all kids, all students, really harkens for me back to what's been going on in K-12 for, you know, 10 or so years about if you're going to set your expectations high, then it's about student supports. Um, second thought is a lot of what you've been talking about is really systemic change and culture change. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on, you know, not kind of innovative programs here and there, but how do you systemically, you know, change an entire culture? And then my, my, my main question is about the Carnegie unit you know, which hasn't come up at all. Um, there's an effort underway at the Carnegie Foundation to kind of look at the Carnegie unit and how it's really an impediment to doing a lot about what you're talking about. You know, we measure what we do in terms of seat time and is that a two Carnegie unit thing or a four Carnegie unit thing? And I'm wondering as a barrier, how can we achieve what you've been talking about as long as we still define ourselves in, uh, you know, credits to degree? And not proficiency. So you had three questions there. <laughs> had, so, choose, uh, choose which one. Which one, do you choose one? one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to make a comment on the K-12 um, um, comment that you made. Certainly there's been rhetoric about setting higher expectations, but actually what's happened is a, f a focus on the floor of achievement that hasn't really helped us get a, a more ready um, K-12 population for university work is my own view and my own read of uh, the research, although there may be arguments in the, in the other direction. I think what we have found in research at the K-12 level, the high school level, and certainly at our university is that setting high expectations with supports, students generally rise to that. And specifically mm -hmm. when, um, you know, there's a tracking system that happens in California right around middle school. And kids get tracked into a kind of math that will never get them the units they need to qualify to get into a CSU or a UC. Uh, when we have moved those students into the right math, 80, 90% of them have succeeded with good teaching, obviously. And it's not easy, because when you're teaching kids with lots of uh, diversity, it's not easy to do it. So I think high expectations certainly are um, you know, a, an absolute key, uh, but as you say, uh, with support. But I, I would question whether or not we've actually set high expectations for our K-12. We recently uh, 
reviewed research that showed, in California at least, only the children who, who scored in the highly proficient uh, band of the state test were college ready. But yet the schools were being judged on proficient and above, which was the much larger. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we were giving them a test that was going, for most of them, nowhere well, by I'll, state policy. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump to the systemic change part of yeah, your good. question, which I think it's exactly what this report is about, is systemic change. It, a different set of attitudes, a different way of doing business. Uh, and being able to do things that have never been done before by anybody in the world, being able to educate a broad spectrum of, of society in large numbers and at high rates. Uh, now, the qu trick is getting to systemic change. Uh, you do not get systemic change by walking in and saying, everything here is wrong, we're going to reorganize the university, we're going uh, we're we're to do this, that, and the other thing, and everything changes next semester. That's not how it works. Um, a very wise man who said it before, um, I was even at, at a point, because I heard it through generations of faculty lore, once said, you do not achieve change in the academy by attacking the disciplines head on. You get at the interstices. You get at the spaces in between. You make your change there. You prove that things work, and then they will seep in and change the system. So it's much more of a diffusion model. Uh, but in order to get that, dif that, to get that um, catalyzed, to get it started, um, to grow it and diffuse it, you need leadership that is consistent day in and day out with the message, what the goals are. Uh, how we get there, you know, if I'm going to California, I've got a variety of highways that'll get me to California. I've got a lot of really bright people called faculty and staff that can figure out the optimal way to get to California. Mm -hmm. One thing that I would volunteer on this is that if you really want to see systemic change work, you've got to have consistent um, well, continuity of leadership. And you really have to have people at the presidential and provost level uh, who are willing to take a position on where you need to get uh, and then be willing to uh, talk about that and talk about that with faculty colleagues and talk about it some more. A friend of mine told me when I was putting in uh, five goals for our university, uh, shortly after I got there, I, I commented, geez, I'm, I'm tired of hearing myself talk about it. You know, I, I'm doing my best. He said, John, when you are sick of hearing yourself talk about it, you are just getting started. <laughs> and and that's, that's true. You've got to be willing to make a personal commitment, professional commitment to the, uh, the kind of change you want to see. And then you've got to ask yourself, uh, are, uh, are the rewards and punishments in the system and focus on the rewards, uh, are they ones that support the attainment of your objectives? Mm -hmm. It's surprising how often they really don't. We talk one game and we reward another. That's right. mm -hmm. uh, so if, you know, if you're willing to make the commitment, if you're willing, uh, if you can attract around you a group of, uh, uh, of uh, leaders uh, on the faculty and in the administration who buy into it and you'll stay with it. Uh, and be consistent in how you, in, in how you uh, reward those who are working with you. Uh, it's surprising how far you really can go. Let, let make your comments very specific and very real in our case. If, if for no other reason that our accrediting body requires it, we have a strategic plan. It's one of our mm -hmm. accreditation requirements. Uh, when we started our current strategic plan, did a public presentation, said this is going to be a very serious process. We want the whole campus involved. Because if we're expecting new results, things are going to change on the campus. Okay, so we got very engaged. When the faculty committee that was working on that plan came up and came up with their language, they had five goals. Five's a good number. Um, one of the goals was improve graduation and retention rates. And it was their third goal. Well, we, we put the five goals out to 24 external stakeholders, elected officials, business and community leaders, um, significant alums, people that have had a high profile in the community. And all 24 people, and it may have been 27, said the same thing. This all sounds very nice. I have no idea what it means. But it's probably good for a university to do. And so working with the committee basically shared that information. Of course, they were forlorn. They're sitting there going, you know, what do we do with this? And I said, what we need to do is rewrite the five goals in a language that they all understand. Yes. And we took that improved retention and graduation rates and rewrote it as we will become a national model to demonstrate that you can graduate students from all backgrounds at high rates. 
and we made that number one. And I talk about it, and it's number one on our web page, it's number one in our publications, and we just drive that message home. It's not that we want to improve the rates, it's that we want to actually show that you can do something that has not been done in the world by hardly anybody. Mm -hmm. And it is possible, and we are doing it. But it takes that commitment, yeah. and everybody on our campus knows that there are no resources for anything other than those five goals. The biggest challenge at a university, we've got so many people who want to go in so many directions. Yeah. People that want to tell me how to invest the endowment. People that want to tell me what I need to do for K through 12. What I need to do for the business community. What I need to do for this discipline or the other discipline. We stay focused on those five goals and our resources drive them. Because if you don't have focus, you're not going to get anywhere. Well, that's what we've done for 21 years. We've had the same five goals. And the, the, the first is to offer the best undergraduate education available in Florida. Now, are we there? Probably not, but we're working on it and we're closer than we were 21 years ago. Especially if you have metrics that would illustrate yeah. to you that yeah. this is the best. Well, yeah. what I tried to do was establish, in effect, directions of travel. So I didn't say we want to have this number on right. some, some scale. Uh, we want to go in this direction, mm -hmm. uh, be America's leading partnership university. Uh, well, you so I, I think it's, I would be very interested, Jane, to hear you comment because you are not a new leader and you are not an established leader, you know, because it's oftentimes you hear, well, as soon as the leader leaves, mm -hmm. things fall apart. So you're an interim. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you experience as you stepped in, and uh, how, has that, how has that role worked? Do you, do you see something mm -hmm. driven down in the institution that's hard to take away? Well, I think there's uh, a couple of uh, thoughts. When, uh, when I was appointed by our president, President Mark Udoff, he specifically said, I'm putting you there to enact the plan that had been set up by the uh, previous uh, chancellor, Timothy White. Mm -hmm. It was a strategic plan with a very you know, clear focus, clear with very clear goals. And so that was a good message. Now I would have, I have to, I, I would pat myself on the back to say, I think I knew that because yeah. I've read the leadership uh, literature and there's a funny thing in higher ed. You know, most faculty think department chair, dean, provost, boy, you're a failed person. You know, academic. You, you weren't good enough to be a really good full professor. You know? So in fact, there's not much honor associated with being leader. But when you look at the really successful <laughs> universities, they have had consistent mm -hmm. leadership yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, a book uh, in the business world, I think Good to Great, Jim Collins' book, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. points that out. It's not the flashiest all the time, but mm -hmm. people who have a consistent focus. So I have, so I, so I got very clear marching orders from our president. You know, don't screw this up. They're on a good path. <laughs> yeah, right. So, And in fact, I, they are, uh, our university is on a really good path. And I think saying it over and over, the tradition is for the chancellor to send a letter out every week to the larger community, about 70,000 people, including students and parents and faculty get it. And I really take that seriously, that there's some part of the strategic plan I re-mention every week, because I think it has to, it's, you know, they, they say in psychology, say it nine times before people even notice. <laughs> so, you, you know. Yeah, we all get tired of hearing ourselves say the same thing again and again and again, yes, but it's but important that we do it. But then people <laughs> are surprised. I didn't know you thought that. I, I get that every week. I didn't know we were doing that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I think that is one of the um, powerful things that I take away from this conversation. You know, um, it's easy when you sit in a foundation, as I used to, or you sit in Washington and you think you could pass a law, you could create a grant program, and, you know, there's one silver bullet of a practice that could somehow magically scale and change everything or a set of rules. I think it's obviously much, much more complex. So um, what, I, what I appreciate also about all of you is that while you are sophisticated about systems change and understand it for the long haul, um, you also have enormous urgency. And so you have been able to calibrate moving institutions actually relatively rapidly. Um, yeah. One would say at warp speed when you think about change in higher education. So to sort of, or we have one more question. Let's do the two more questions. Oh, good. I may not ask my last question. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's go, go for up. that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Natalie Johnson and I'm with the New Faculty Majority Foundation Board. And we are a coalition for adjunct, contingent, non-tenure track faculty. And I think that with a lot of the high impact practices that you've espoused as being essential for uh, students of color, underrepresented students to succeed, you need to have faculty there to enact it. And with 70% of faculty now being off of the tenure track, and if you look at, ten, if you look at the 10% of faculty of color or underrepresented groups 
who are on ten who you know who are on tenure track another 76 percent of those people are not on tenure track how are you looking at the composition of your faculty to move from non-tenure track back to tenure track so that there are people there who can support the students who need the support good question thank you I'll start with we have many types of faculty. We have, we have tenure track faculty. We also have full time faculty who are not tenure track or they're primarily for instruction. They're actually some of our most innovative faculty, particularly with using technology because they're doing exactly what they want to do. We also have adjuncts who teach part time and maybe only for one semester or a year. Uh, we have professionals in the community that come in and come out. And I think the reality is to be able to manage all the things that we're doing, we have to have a variety of different types of faculty. And that there, there is not going to be, again, this is sort of cutting away at the, the myth of the university where every single faculty member is a tenure, tenure track faculty member teaching a small number of students. That, that, that's not scalable and sustainable. And I think reward systems have to follow that. Uh, you know, even among our tenure track faculty, we have options for their rewards to be shifted over toward teaching, for example, mm -hmm. at particular times in their, in their career. We have an option that I really love in the University of California where we have lecturers who actually can gain tenure. Right. And they can move from lecturers to you know, senior lecturers, distinguished lecturers. They are part of the academic senate. And th I think this really raises the role of teaching. You know, people worry about that uh, and probably inordinately worry about uh, uh, teaching. Uh, because I would agree that most of our best researchers are also our best teachers. And, yep. uh, but I love this particular employment series because we actually offer security of employment over time uh, for people who meet very, very high rigorous standards, but in teaching and evaluating their teaching and changing their teaching to meet the needs of students. So John, before you um, answer, I, I think she was asking a slightly different question, which is given the large dependence on adjunct faculty uh, in many institutions, what are the strategies um, to help empower them in this vision and also make sure that, the, that their roles and mm -hmm. you know, comp their, their place mm -hmm. in the university is thought through? Yeah, I, wa I want to hire more of them as into this role of, um, of this le lecturers with, mm -hmm. with, with the tenure because I want them in the academic senate, if they're of that quality, to be really promoting the, the creativity and innovation of all the faculty on the teaching mm -hmm. side, and that they're, they're cutting edge in their understanding of research from, from that from interaction. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. From, from time to time, we ask our uh, deans to go through and, and look at the number of adjuncts who are teaching multiple sections. And sometimes you, you find things that just astound you. You may have an adjunct who's teaching two courses in three different departments. You, you know, if you don't have a good right. human resources system to warn you about that, you'll see it. Uh, probably not anything you ought to be super proud of, uh, but you ought to be looking for a way to take that person to a full-time appointment if it's a lecturer, or instructor, or tenure line or faculty position. Mm -hmm. um, first off, just from a humane standpoint, they'll get benefits that not, they're not going to get as adjuncts. Uh, I think that offers some opportunities if you move people into these roles. We've got a, a, a promotion path for uh, non-tenure track faculty members uh, for the first time and uh, just added in the last year or so. So we're trying to make a better, um, trying to give better uh, employment status uh, to uh, the non-tenure track faculty members as, uh, as uh, uh, you are, uh, Jane. I, I think this is a real issue we're going to have yeah. to deal with because there's Absolutely. been a big shift away from yeah. uh, tenure track faculty members. Although I must say the number one element in our work plan for the coming year as filed with our, our uh, Board of Governors is to add more tenure track faculty members. Yeah, I don't see us re reducing the number of tenure track faculty. I do see us hiring more full time yes. instructional faculty with a career and ladder for them. Replacements right. to the right. tenure right. line faculty. Right. Yep. As, yeah. as as really, yeah, as I would say that's a strong theme we heard across your institutions, ASU um, included. So, and I think that's not incompatible. You, you couldn't have the vision you have yeah. about um, getting better and better and better at a student centric institution without asking those questions of your of yourselves. Mm -hmm. One, uh, one other last hand. Last question between us and lunch. I know something about the advantages of large organizations and also their disadvantages. Mm -hmm. yes. I was wondering whether um, our leaders could comment about uh, the trade-offs between growing an existing organization and building a new organization. 
I eat, I was young enough, when I was very young, I remember people in California arguing about what the optimal size of a UC campus was, whether it was 20 or 25,000. And since those limits have been busted, I wonder if anybody has an ideal optimal, optimal size, especially since we're talking about innovation nowadays. Yeah, I, I don't know what the optimal size is, but I know that we are thinking differently. For example, um, now we're thinking instead of building out, 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 we're building in, in, in. So, uh, so that students can actually walk from place to place. So uh, it doesn't exactly answer your question, but I, I'm aware that we're all considering in terms of our capital planning and other scheduling about how to keep, no matter how, you know, even though we've went from 3,000, 5,000, 8,000, 17,000, now 20, almost, tw almost 22,000. Uh, so we're not huge yet, but how do you keep that at a human scale so students can really access what's there? Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. I'd say we don't have the answer for optimal, and I don't know if there is an optimal across higher education. What I can say is that what we do understand is markets. Okay, And that's something else that you probably remember from IBM, is you can only thrive as an organization if you have a market. And so we start, we're celebrating our centennial this year. A hundred years ago, we were an evening school for working businessmen. They were all male, they were all white, and there were 48 of them. <laughs> Today, there's 32,000 students. They're majority female, they're majority minority, which means there is no majority student population. Uh, Hispanics, Asian Americans, African Americans, whites, and students who self-identify as mixed race all exist in large percentages on our campus. What we do know is that we can serve our markets at scale. Um, and the key is, as we grow, is that we never lose the ability to deliver a quality education that gives the student the opportunity for both the academic experience, but that engagement piece that we've talked about. And we, we haven't hit a scale barrier yet. That's all I can say. Can I um, come back to the first part of that question, which was also, I think, about how you innovate, you know, the tension between innovating in a large institution versus um, SWAT teams, smaller, um, or starting new. You made a comment early on about aim your innovation at the university. Disease. Well, so and it's also is you, you do pilots, you do pilot projects. You, there's no sense in doing a, a university-wide big change if you don't know, have the data to show it's going to work. So you start off small, you try it. If it works, then you figure out how to scale it. And we do that again and again and again as we attack different issues that are barriers or, or um, obstacles for students on the path to success. And the good news is we have brilliant faculty and staff, and they have a lot of ideas. I don't have any trouble uh, finding a good idea about how to improve. Yeah. I have trouble choosing among a, vari a, a wide variety of, of great ideas that I wish I could find all. It's a high class problem to have. It is. It uh, is. I'm lucky. You know, uh, we really need to ask the question about whether there is an optimal size in some Aristotelian sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there is. I, I used to think there probably was because I watched Texas and Minnesota and one or two others, and when they got above 50,000, they said, we want to go back to being a little less than, a little smaller than 50,000 enrollment. Well, we worried a lot about that, and then, you know, we passed 50,000, and the data keep looking better, uh, and students report real satisfaction with their experiences. Uh, we're, you know, we, we, we receive more SAT referrals than any other institution in, in Florida. So we're an institution of choice. Now we're not as much of an institution of choice as the Gators are, probably not quite with the Seminoles, uh, but we're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're doing pretty well. And uh, I, 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 I sometimes am, am criticized by people who think we're too big and I often have to bite my tongue and, and say, well, let's compare uh, uh, metrics at our two institutions. Mm -hmm. and, well, and I think technology is allowing to push back yeah, those barriers. We're, a, we're able to do things at scale that we couldn't have done without some of the emerging yes. technologies, right. particularly in the area of big data, predictive analytics, yeah. um, some of those, as well as instructional uses of technology. The other thing we have to acknowledge, I think, is that as you have sustained growth, and it's fairly rapid, there are systems that work at one size and don't work at another. Right. And there are people who work at one size and don't work at another. And if you're unwilling to address both, you're headed for problems. If you're not ready to say to someone who's been a good and productive employee, you know, things worked really well for you when we were this big, but you know, we're this big now. 
Yeah. How do we how do we deal with this? Uh, that's a problem. I think that's a great note to end on because our panel after lunch is going to be coming back to these questions of leadership uh, and, and all of the kinds of challenges that come together with them. And I think also, you know, implicit in your responses um, was somebody asked over here earlier about the question of, of seat time, the one thing we haven't mm -hmm. changed is the Carnegie unit. Yep. I think you did hear across each of your institutions, and particularly, I think, when Michael was speaking earlier about yeah, once, you take, yeah. once you take away, I think you are thinking about time mm -hmm. um, in a very different way. And that, to me, seems to be a critical way to unlock how you get a highly personalized experience yes. within yeah, um, sure. a, large, a large institution. So thanks to the panel. Uh, lunch is served outside. Thanks to all of you for hanging in for an intense discussion.